let's look at some of the most common execution techniques with living of the land binaries. We've already come across quite a few of those. For example, we have been using the command terminal a lot. And through the command terminal, which is typically what a thread actor has a session established with, you can execute all kinds of things. Seeing that just by typing calc, we, for example, would be able to execute the calculator. We can execute PowerShell and things along those lines. Now let's discuss some of the most prevalent techniques that thread actors are executing, because a lot of these techniques obviously also blend in on a daily basis based on all the noise that you see in enterprise environments. There's always command terminals, there's always PowerShell, and there's always applications that are using PowerShell and all kinds of scripts in order to operate and do their tasks. So one thing that we need to be aware of is context. So we see that command terminal would then often execute PowerShell, and then if PowerShell is going to execute a command, that would then execute another tool such as malicious tool. In our case, we can also just do calculator exe again. We would now have a process chain of calculator being executed by PowerShell, which is being executed by command terminal. Now, based on your environment, you might be able to establish a baseline and understand what's normal in order to better detect what does not look normal. Let's look at some of the variations of uh, famous PowerShell execution commands that you see carried out by thread actors constantly. To do so, we need to go into our resources module three folder and there's execution. So for this exercise, we just need to copy the PowerShell execution one file. We can copy it into our desktop and that's the one that we are going to be working with. So this doesn't show the file extension. We can actually just real quick fix this by going to open a file explorer, go view and pin this and then say, show file name extensions. And voila, so now we actually can see the file name extension. So this is a little bit more helpful. And this is why this means that this is actually a batch script which can be executed through the command line terminal. Now, if we would do that, we can open a command line terminal here. Let's change the directory to desktop. Then to double check, we can do dir to see we are in the same directory where this batch file is located. Let's just execute it and see what happens. Oh, this just disappeared. Now, that's a common thing that you see. Now we're wondering obviously what's in there, what just happened. To look inside a file, we can just right click and do edit. And this should open up the notepad, which shows us the content of this batch script. And here we see something very, very common. You see that there's a batch script, which can be executed by the command line terminal, which then in turn calls a PowerShell process, which has a couple of parameters as well as some obfuscated payload. And this is something that every analyst should be familiar with. This just oftentimes is a sign of for some malicious activity. Although there's of course applications that would also create payloads and commands like this, but it certainly is something that is also being generated a lot by post exploitation frameworks. So what are we looking at here? There's PowerShell and then we have NOP W hidden dash encoded command. To explore this a little further, we can open command terminal and then just type PowerShell and call the help function. And this will explain those parameters to us and why those are very popular, especially for malicious actors. So the first thing is NOP. NOP stands for no profile. So this doesn't load a Windows PowerShell profile. It's just a more like a simple version of executing PowerShell with less noise. The next one is W hidden. Now W stands for window style and the window style can be normal, minimized, maximized or hidden. This is actually the reason why there's always a W hidden or it can also indicate a W and then a number one, which is also stands for hidden. That is the reason why the window was closing out right away. And this is what often happens if a user accidentally clicks on a malicious file, there might be a quick pop-up, but then it disappears again and we don't know what just happened. 
And this is oftentimes the reason because those scripts are called including the commands that make it disappear as quickly as possible again. And then lastly, we can also see encoded command. So this is often also just abbreviated by ENZ. And that basically accepts base64 encoded strings. So this payload is base64 encoded. We don't see what's in there. It's one way of hiding the malicious content, but usually it's not too hard to decode this. So we can look into that as well. Now, with that in mind, we also have one more parameter that we haven't seen yet because we are running everything as administrator. And if you execute files on a user environment, you probably sometimes see execution policy and then the value bypass to it. So that basically means that the PowerShell script can run unrestricted. So if you are an administrator, you can run any script with the execution policy set to bypass to make it run unrestricted. And there we go. So now we know how PowerShell was called. We just don't know what was called. And this is the payload that comes with it. So base64 encoded, as we can imagine, it's pretty simple and straightforward to decode that. And for that, we can jump into CyberChef in our browsers and just copy paste the payload into the tool. So I've already done so. You can see here there's CyberChef. You can Google that. And once you have it open, you can copy and paste your base64 payload into the input field. Now the output is the same because we are not doing any transformation yet. But one thing that we can do because we know this is base64 is go to favorites and then from base64 because we want to decode this from base64 and we can already see that this is starting to make sense. Every other byte basically represents a character that we can read. There's null bytes in between and this is because of some decoding that's going on here, but we can remove those null bytes by looking for a function that's called remove null bytes. So if you drag and drop this function here, we have quickly been able to decode this payload that we just executed. And this particular script might already look familiar to some people. This is very closely resembling real world payloads that are being used by frameworks such as COBOL Strike, for example, to execute their beacons, which establish command and control to the servers. Obviously slightly modified, but let's analyze this from start to finish real quick. So the set strict mode version two doesn't really matter too much to us. This is just something that enforces strict coding practices for PowerShell. Then the next thing is we have a variable that's called do it and everything is getting passed into do it. And later on, we can see that do it is either going to be called in the if statement to start a job, which essentially is just checking whether we want to run on a 32-bit or on a 64-bit environment. So typically we would end up here. And this already shows another really interesting and important expression. IEX means invoke expression, everything that's in here. So that's basically means execute everything that we have stored in our do it variable. Now payload can be piped into IEX or IEX can be used to call a variable. There's a couple of different variations to use IEX, but it very commonly occurs in malicious scripts. So now in order to figure out what our payload is doing, we need to understand this line here. And this is a very common one as well, because oftentimes the real malicious information or payload or scripts are again wrapped into another base64 encoded and sometimes even encrypted functions so there's a from base64 st string method and then there is get a string from this unicode payload so basically once we decode from base64 we get unicode and from unicode we need to then to convert it to a string so that this string can then be passed into the invoke expression method so all we need to do now is just to copy this again and pass it into the input field so that we get the output field. And with the settings of base64 and remove null bytes, we can now read the malicious payload. In our case, it was just a sample that says, write host, hello world. So with that in mind, one thing that we could also do with malicious samples, especially in sandboxes, is we could remove this dash w and hidden statement and once we save that, we could just try to run the script again without hidden because that means it should actually not close out on us. So let's go back to the command line terminal and com 
change the directory again to desktop and then just autocomplete the PowerShell exec1.batch script and hit enter. Now you can see what executed. So this is basically the payload. And then we can see the output of this payload, hello world, because its purpose was to write to the console, hello world. So again, this is a very common variant of how to execute malicious payloads with PowerShell. It oftentimes looks very similar. And within this encoded payload, it's important to understand how to decode it because there could be critical information, especially when, when it comes to indicators of compromise, for example, IP addresses where additional payload might be downloaded from or interesting files that might be executed by the script. And finally, to show the real world version of the script, this is a Cobalt Strike beacon, how it was executed through xenb.exe, opened by PowerShell, and then the same parameters, encoded command, but obviously just a much, much, much longer payload associated with it. So we can now just take the payload, decode the payload, and you can already see this is what the thread actors have passed into some of those decoding functions. So basically we have again, a longer version of the space 64 string. And then this base 64 string, once this is done, we have an execution of creating a new object, stream reader. And then the most important part is this variable, dollar sign $s, being passed into a gzip stream. So basically decompressed. That means the way how we see it here, it's a gzip compressed payload. So this is what we keep need to keep in mind to decode this. We can just go ahead, copy this base 64 encoded payload and then unzip it with gzip. So again, just copy and pasting this into our input. Right now it doesn't make sense. We have from base64, but then again, this gibberish, we need to unzip it with gzip. And for this, we can just call the gunzip function. And now we can see the actual payload of this Cobalt Strike beacon. So very similar along the lines of what we've seen earlier, there's the do it function. And at the end of the script, do it gets executed. And in between there, we have a whole bunch of maliciousness that is going on here, basically just some functions in order to allocate some space in the memory and then execute a malicious script where the payload is again passed into another function that is being base64 encoded, and then also XOR encrypted. And that's essentially shellcode, but what we could technically see if we decode this is also the IP address where this script, once it gets executed, is, is calling out to. So this is how we quickly got from just executing something, a script with PowerShell, to really deep down into what real-world payloads would actually do. And this is important to keep in mind when it comes to monitoring for PowerShell executions.